Okay, so uh, let's get started with our next panel. Uh, of course, an integral process of the Alaska Constitution has been emphasized both by uh, Dean Shemarinsky and our first panel is interpreting the Alaska Constitution. And uh, a vital part of that is uh, who we have as our judges. And so this panel is going to be focusing on the Alaska Judicial Council and the judicial selection process. And our moderator for this panel is Judge Larry Card, uh, retired Judge Larry Card, who's also helping us out uh, as an adjunct professor this semester teaching introduction to law here at UAA. We're very thankful to have him for that. He may not be thankful, but we're thankful. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Judge Card. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, many familiar faces. I'm sorry to get a chance to talk to you before we uh, get started, but uh, maybe I will. Marilyn, seen her many times, and other people in and out of court. Uh, David George is back there slinking somewhere in the back. He and I went through some battles together before I became a judge, Judge Tan. But anyway, uh, welcome to this program. Um, if indicated that uh, possibly I could introduce, maybe I'll let these people introduce themselves. And so uh, I think we have the first speaker going to be on my left. So introduce yourself and uh, tell us what we should hear about this matter. Uh, my name is Brett Frazier. I'm a December 2017 graduate of the University of Michigan Law School. So I was a 3L less than a year ago, and here I am. <laughs> um, I attended the University of Alaska Anchorage as a college student where um, I was a member of the debate team and uh, was twice a national semifinalist and the second ranked speaker in the country. Um, I say that to combat, perhaps undermining my credibility with the previous statement. And um, <laughs> I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I w wrote my article with uh, Justice uh, Walter Carpinetti, who many of you will know is the former Chief Justice of the Alaska Supreme Court. And I'd briefly just like to thank him. Without his Herculean effort, the article that we produced would not have materialized. And his feedback and mentorship was uh, profoundly valuable. I learned more about writing and about the judiciary in the few months I worked with him than I did throughout my three years in law school. So um, big thanks to him. He has absconded to Italy and left me with presentation responsibilities. <laughs> Hi, I'm Susie Josic. I'm the staff attorney for the Alaska Judicial Council. And um, I've been there, I've been with the council, I think 17 years now. And I've had the great privilege to uh, have had the opportunity to um, really uh, work with our judicial selection system to uh, implement the goals of our Constitution. Susie, I, 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 first of all, you don't have a microphone, so if it's possible for you to speak loud, that would be... Oh, I'm sorry. I have this, cons uh, this well, microphone. It's a microphone for the... Oh, for the camera. Oh, okay. Camera, I'm sorry. The, I thought we audience. were projecting, but yeah. I can do that. Uh, is everybody can hear me? Okay. Great. Okay, as uh, Brian said, I'm Larry Card. I was appointed by Justice, uh, Justice by Governor Hickel in 1993. And um, some of you may remember, it was an interesting time. Uh, Governor Hickel, of course, was always uh, a high energy, uh, very interesting man. He and I had something in common. We both grew up in Kansas. And um, when my name and three others were, were pre presented by the Judicial uh, Council that year. He didn't want any of them and made it quite public that he would rather um, pick somebody that he liked uh, rather than this Judicial Council selection. And uh, the Judicial Council advised him that he could not do that under our Constitution, under Article 4. And so it went back and forth and I think there was some threat of litigation. Some of you in the audience may know about that. Um, myself and really capable people, uh, Brant McGee, who was in charge of OPA, um, Mike Wolverton, who was a district court judge then, who was putting his name in a hat for Superior Court, and um, Peter Ashman, who was also a district court judge. And so all of our names were put in, but he didn't want any. And uh, over a period of if it's not weeks, um, at least days that turn into weeks, he decided he'd make a selection. So um, I received a call to go to the governor's office and he and I spent most of our time talking about Western Kansas. He grew up in Dodge City, Kansas, the old Western town. I grew up in a place called Liberal, which is 
almost to Oklahoma. It's about three miles off out the uh, Oklahoma Panhandle. And so we spent most of our time talking about Kansas and, and that was the interview. Um, and that broke the deadlock and it quieted out. And we haven't had any issues set, uh, since that time, to my knowledge. You've been on 17 years? I just, we have had a few. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not so public. Just a couple, yeah. But uh, anyway, I survived that process. Uh, getting there was a little bit interesting. Um, some, of, some of the articles that have come out or will be coming out in the Law Review, though, talk about the uh, tie-breaking that the Chief Justice has. His function is to break a tie. And uh, the Chief Justice, when I was, my name and 13 others were put in, uh, he decided that he should be the tie-breaker and he voted me in. Danny Moore was the uh, justice, Chief Justice at that time. And um, I had known him when I was in practice, but I never worked for him. He, had, he was part of the Delaney Wiles Reitman Moore, Brubaker, da 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 da. Uh, some prominent lawyers who became judges came out of that office. But anyway, uh, that was an interesting time and shows how well our system works. Uh, our merit system is supposed to produce not those who are just politically connected, but those who can do the job. And, and <coughs> it was not as, as uh, tough as my time to spent in the military getting ready for all that training. But the, uh, the process was uh, dedicated, I'll put it that way. And never mean, never mean spirited, always courteous. But, you know, the interview process, um, the process works. I like the articles, that, the drafts of the articles that came out uh, about the lack of, of scandal and all the other issues that other states have had with judges who are politically appointed. So uh, that's a short version of my experience with the process and I, when I get a chance, I do speak in favor of it uh, because many of our, our citizens don't understand this process and they see a name but they don't take time to read the Judicial Council's recommendations or all the information that goes in that, they really don't understand. So the education process for the electorate is, is very important. So having said all that, I'll turn it back to you, sir. Um. So I'd like to do three things and some brief remarks in the interest of time. The first is provide kind of a crash course in the merit-based selection process for those who are potentially unfamiliar with it. The second is talk about the history of Article 4 and the historical and legal forces that led to the creation of a merit-based selection system in Alaska. And third, talk about some shortcomings that exist in the literature and potential areas for further research. Um, so very, very briefly, uh, Alaska's merit-based selection system moves in three phases. The first phase is nomination by the Judicial Council, which is a seven-member body comprised of three lawyers who are elected by the Board of Governors from the Alaska Bar Association, three members of the public who are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the legislature, and then the Chief Justice of the Alaska Supreme Court serves as an ex officio seventh member. These members serve staggered six-year terms to ensure that the uh, council cannot be stacked by one political entity or interest. And this first step really focuses on merit. Uh, to quote Ralph Rivers, who is a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, the Judicial Council will, quote, seek for the best available timber. And when the Judicial Council is reviewing applications, it uses uh, seven evaluative criteria, those being professional competence, integrity, fairness, temperament, judgment, legal and life experience, and then a demonstrated commitment to public and community service. I won't go into all the details of how the council carries out these responsibilities, but suffice it to say it's extraordinarily thorough. Um, the second phase is appointment by the governor. And this strikes a balance between selecting the best possible timber, as Rivers put it, as well as satisfying the demands of popular sovereignty, the idea that the people should have some say in the composition of the bench, which rules when they are parties uh, before the court. And then the final phase is the retention or rejection uh, by the electorate. And the first retention election for any judge occurs no less than three years after they're initially appointed by the governor, and then depending on what level of court, wh where they serve in Alaska, there'll be uh, retention elections as many as 10 years after that for members of the Supreme Court. So hope that provides some background and contextualizes um, the next point I'd like to make. 
So as has been a theme throughout this symposium, I think it's important to contextualize the drafting of Alaska's Constitution, and in particular, Article 4, in, the, in history, and really place it in history. Um, professor Jed Sugarman, who is a professor at Fordham University, uh, he published a book, uh, a very exhaustive book that I read, um, which documented um, the evolution of the various court systems throughout all of American history. And Jed Sugarman points to the decades between 1950 and 1970 as, quote, the Merit Revolution. During that time, the Missouri Plan, which is the plan that I just described, although Alaska's has been modified from the original Missouri Plan, um, this plan spread through 19 states. And in addition to those 19 states that fully embraced the Missouri Plan, nine other states adopted elements of that plan whether it be the use of a professional council to select candidates for judgeships, or whether it be an apolitical retention system. In my review of the literature, I have found four historical forces that I think informed the creation of Article 4 as we have it today. The first is the American Judicature Society, which was a society that was kind of born of a desire to create uh, robust, independent courts, satisfying the Hamiltonian vision of the separation of powers, a judiciary that would be insulated from the populist demands of the majority. Um, that uh, body, the Judic Judicature Society, actually created the theoretical underpinnings of the Missouri Plan in the 1920s. And they did so largely in response to states frequently overturning their benches um, in the judiciary because elections were constantly forcing judges out. And the American Judicature Society thought this is not satisfying the Hamiltonian vision um, of an independent judiciary. The second force that I, um, uh, Sugarman identifies is that political parties in states in the 1950s were worried about the populist uprisings that characterized the political arena during the Great Depression and World War II. Um, as previous speakers have mentioned, uh, labor unions became more powerful forces during the Great Depression, and those forces organized not only to elect politicians, but at times organized for or against particular judicial candidates. And so the merit selection system is, according to some experts, a response to those populist uprisings of the 1930s and 40s. Third, and somewhat cynically, um, business interests were concerned with labor litigation and labor unions increasing success in judicial, select, uh, judicial elections, and thus those business entities had a vested interest in securing merit-based selection. And fourth, World War II and the fight against uh, fascism informed American thinking on individual rights and the expansion of judicial review. This was reinforced by the Cold War tensions. Um, I learned constitutional law from a man named Richard Primus. Uh, he also serves as a, as a mentor to me. And he's written extensively about this, doc explaining how it was very easy for Soviet propaganda to characterize the racism and classism of 1950s America as a terrible alternative to Soviet communism. And thus, the intellectual elite in the United States did have a vested interest in using the courts as a vehicle to combat that when elections proved insufficient. Now, all of these forces can be viewed cynically. You can say, ah, it was the intellectual elite, and it was business interests and political parties. But I don't actually take that view. I think that you can observe the historical realities of these forces, yet give them a more generous interpretation. At the end of the day, multiple elements of American society, people using political parties as their vehicles, uh, intellectuals, business interests, as well as the people themselves, all um, wanted and wished for a more independent and robust judiciary. To put it succinctly, all the parties that I've just talked about wanted good judges. They wanted judges who would be insulated from the demands of populism. So I don't think a cynical interpretation of those historical forces is necessary, though I do think it's important to acknowledge their reality. Turning now to Alaska specifically, Alaska was the first state um, to adopt merit selection in two respects. First, Alaska was the first state to adopt merit selection in all of its courts. And second, and perhaps more importantly, Alaska was the first state to really use merit selection as a pitch as part of statehood. As Herb Hischler mentioned, um, quote, we have a product to sell. We had better make that constitution pretty liberal if we are going to get into the union. 
Now, when Hitchler used the word liberal, he, of course, did not mean politically liberal. He meant classically liberal. He wanted to state that protected free markets had a robust rule of law, democratic institutions, what you typically think of when you think of classically liberal. Now, this is important because what that means is that when Alaska's constitution was created, it had to appeal to numerous constituencies. It had to appeal to Alaskans themselves, obviously. It had to appeal to a national audience that included both politicians as well as business interests. And it had to appeal to investors so that b business would be attracted to Alaska. These forces are all important considerations in, value, in understanding why we have merit selection. Now, merit selection was not without its detractors. Um, at the Constitutional Convention, the delegates to that convention voted overwhelmingly for merit selection. There was, however, a small minority who vocally opposed merit selection. That vocal minority, um, Robert McNeely, um, a delegate to the convention, uh, spoke most powerfully. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that I was a debater, and so I really like kind of analyzing how people make arguments. And Robert McNeely is really frustrating, because when you go back and you actually read the um, Constitutional Convention, um, he doesn't make straightforward arguments. He preferred to kind of posit these really elaborate hypotheticals. And so it's a little bit difficult to ascertain what his criticisms of merit selection actually were. Um, in reading his uh, comments, many, many times, um, I, dis I uncovered what I believe are his two fundamental criticisms. The first criticism of merit selection that was brought to the convention was the power of incumbency. And this is not without theoretical merit. There, is there are political scientists who study the incumbency advantage. And in an apolitical system where judges aren't challenged by another individual running for that office, there is some data to suggest that there's an incumbency advantage. However, I think the persuasive force of this argument isn't as relevant in the year 2018. The reason being is that in 1975, the Alaska legislature tasked the Alaska Judicial Council with evaluating candidates who were up for their retention election. So rather than the electorate being forced to determine on their own whether the judges were doing a good job, there is now a tremendous amount of data that voters can use and even participate in at hearings to be part of the evaluative process for those judges. So while I think that um, McNeely's arguments were perhaps relevant in the 1950s, I don't think that argument actually has much persuasive force today. The second argument is that members of the council themselves would be beholden to the interests of the entity that appointed them. So McNeely was concerned that lawyers would basically use the council as a vehicle to um, propel their own self-interests, whatever they may be, and that the individuals appointed by the governor would merely represent the political party or the political interests of the governor that appointed um, those members of the council. The data, however, doesn't really bear this out. Um, Justice Carpenetti and I looked uh, at a lot of uh, documents from the Alaska Judicial Council, and we found that in 60% of, 60 of uh, the time when the um, council is evaluating a candidate, they vote unanimously. 80% of the time, they vote unanimously minus one individual. And in only 18 cases, which is 1.3% of those cases, was the council evenly split with three lawyers advocating for or against the um, selection of a judge, and the three lay members of the council advocating for the lay members of the judge. Um, and this means that in, the, in those cases, the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court would have to serve as a tiebreaker. But interestingly enough, in those 18 cases, nine times the Chief Justice has sided with the lawyers, and the other nine times the Chief Justice has sided with the lay members. So I just don't really think that, as an empirical matter, it's true that people on the council are simply there uh, as kind of narrow, self-interested actors. Um, obviously, people who are, have been on the council or have experience with the council will want to express that they try to do the best job of selecting judges, and the data supports this conclusion. So to kind of wrap this up, McNeely had these two criticisms, but neither has been borne out in history, and neither, in our view, um, our being Bud and I's view, um, has proved to be um, meritous. 
Now, there have also been challenges um, since the Constitutional Convention to the merit-based selection system. Uh, there has been a lawsuit, uh, Miller v. Carpinetti, which challenged the merit-based selection system under equal protection grounds. Um, Bud wrote this section of the paper, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. And any difficult questions you have, uh, you can email him. Um, but very, very briefly, um, both the District Court and the Ninth Circuit reached two conclusions. The first is that you can't really bring an equal protection challenge because the one person, one vote principle doesn't apply in Alaska because Alaska doesn't have elections. That's a pretty self-evident argument. Um, but second, I think a close reading of the Ninth Circuit's case reveals something more fundamental, and that's the concern of federalism, that the people of Alaska um, ought to be able to craft their own judiciary in the image of how they see fit. And while the Ninth Circuit which the decision was unanimous, by the way, never comes out and expressly says that. I think that that principle of federalism informs the entirety of that opinion. In addition to uh, um, lawsuits, there has been attempts to amend uh, Alaska's constitution. Um, the most uh, recent attempt was Senate Joint Resolution 21, which sought to modify the composition of the Judicial Council such that the governor would be able to appoint 10 members and the Alaska Bar would only be able to provide five members. Um, I think the kind of cynical view here is that the governor is attempting to capture the Judicial Council. And um, there is some empirical research suggesting that when you give the government, the governor, excuse me, more control over the composition of a professional council, the judges whom that council appoints express more party bias. Now let me be clear here. That doesn't mean that the decisions are worse. That doesn't mean that the decisions themselves betray party bias. What that means, though, is in states that have modified the composition of their professional councils, more judges, I'll use an example, in Florida, um, Florida had a system similar to Alaska's. They amended their constitution to provide the governor with more power. The number of, the governor happened to be Republican. The number of judges who were registered Republican, who then made it to the bench, increased dramatically. But this isn't to say that Republican judges issue decisions that are less robust than Democratic judges. What it does tell you is that the party affiliation of those judges more closely resembles the party affiliation of the governor. So this brings me, finally, to areas where I think the literature is somewhat lacking and areas where uh, yeah, young lawyers like me might have to do a little more work. Um, so I think there are two areas um, where the literature could be improved. The first area is a deep dive into the evaluative criteria one would use to assess judicial performance. Now, this is really, really hard because asking when is a judge doing a good job necessarily asks a deeper question of what is the proper role of the judge in American society. You might think that of the proper role of a judge is to respond to, at least in some degree, the popular will, in which case you might prefer elections. If, on the other hand, your vision of the state's judiciary is one that wishes to insulate judges um, from, from the popular will when it's legal and necessary to do so, you'll have a different idea. However, I do think there ought to be at least an attempt to establish some sort of quantitative evaluation of judicial performance. There have been some attempts at this. For example, um, a paper that was published by um, someone named Salakar um, discovered that in appointive systems, judges in those systems are cited more frequently by other circuits. They're cited more frequently in law review articles. This suggests that their opinions are more clearly written or more persuasive, and they're disciplined less frequently by disciplinary bodies, suggesting that they most more closely adhere to norms. However, this only scratches the surface, and I think a really interesting paper in the future could be one that really, really tries to assess judicial performance across different systems. Um, that's obviously a challenge, and I think it's been a challenge for many, many years. Um, I actually, one of the footnotes in our paper was from Professor Tarr, who I know has, has written some, something about this. Um, and uh, the second area of improvement is, I think, a narrow examination of how retention elections specifically affect judicial behavior. Uh, the Brennan Center for Justice uh, published a literature review that looked at 10 different studies and found that uh, campaigns against judges who are running in elective uh, systems are hard, hard, issue harder, harsher sentences um, when they're labeled as being soft on crime and that spill spills over into all sorts of cases. So if you are accused of being soft on crime with respect to sex crime, the data suggests that the judges facing 
elections will actually issue harsher sentences across the board because it's difficult to predict when the public will be upset um, at what is perceptibly or to the public apparently a lenient sentence. However, the data haven't really explored in detail that effect on retention elections specifically. The Brennan Center looked at some retention systems and found an effect that I think is somewhat tenuous. So given the fact, um, <laughs> I think the underlying kind of message here is we're currently witnessing a, a campaign to unseat a judge this year um, who received a positive recommendation from the council. Um, if that campaign is successful, it will be the first time in Alaska's since it would be the first time since 1975 that a judge has lost his or her retention election despite re receiving a positive recommendation from the council. Um, I believe that that may have consequences. I won't come down either way and say it will or it won't, but it's certainly a possibility, and I think a future, er a future areas um, of research should examine that possibility. And that's the end. <laughs> Wow, so uh, that was super impressive. And um, I just want to uh, thank Brett for his, uh, his presentation and laying the foundation. Uh, can everybody hear me? No, okay, so laying the foundation for um, my presentation. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Terry Carnes, who's a co-author of our article that's going to be published as part of this symposium. Um, she's been a wonderful role model and uh, colleague through my 17 years. And also Suzanne DiPietro, the executive, executive director of the council, who's been a great mentor to me and um, an integral part of this process. So um, we're going to bring it down a notch because uh, we've had a lot of discussion of the theoretical underpinnings and the, the principles surrounding the constitutional goals of um, uh, both the Constitution overall and in Alaska and uh, in the merit selection system, but how does it really work? You know, um, the, the delegates, uh, when they <coughs> convened the convention and presented the Judiciary Article, um, they wanted two things. They wanted a, a system with fair judges, fair and impartial judges, because they had been coming out of a system of territorial judges um, who they did not believe uh, applied the law in a fair way all the time. And they were also concerned with the competency of these judges who are often political appointees from places like Ohio and, um, and Washington State where they didn't know Alaska, they didn't know what concerned the citizens of Alaska, they, um, they were political hacks sometimes and, and they just really didn't care, they didn't do their jobs. And so they wanted a workable system and they wanted fair judges. Um, and there were two concerns two main concerns at the convention. And the first was, what kind of system do we want? And the delegates, they presented, or the, the Judiciary Committee delegates presented a system of merit selection to, um, to the, the body as a whole, or, as a whole. and then they, they, there was a lot of discussion. McNeely's uh, conversation was part of that. Um, but they voted overwhelmingly to, to adopt the merit selection system. And the second concern, they went through all the articles and passed them pretty summarily after that concern had been addressed. But the one hang-up they had, uh, the only other hang-up they really had about uh, the judiciary article, is what qualifications should judges have? Should they um, be... Uh, you know, should the Constitution address whether they should be in practice for, for X number of years, how old they should be, um, what, what, uh, what kind of, you know, experience should they have had? And they ultimately came down on the side of, we're not going to really talk about that. We're going to require the council to present at least two names to the governor, but we're going to leave all the details to the Judicial Council. We're going to leave it to this body to decide. And they even talked about, um, during the convention, they talked about things like, well, this is, you know, we're, we're 
coming out of a ter territorial system, but things are going to change. The, the, um, the number of lawyers is going to change. People are going to come and go. Should we really, uh, should we really address the fact that you know, we shouldn't allow a person who isn't from Alaska to become a judge? And so they left all these details to the Judicial Council to figure out. And this um, has brought about a system of the implementation of those, th those goals of a fair judiciary and a workable system that has been both forward thinking and, um, and very flexible and adaptable to both progress and the current, um, the current council members as a reflection of our state citizenry. And uh, it, it's really been an amazing system to watch, especially over the, the course of 20 years that I've been on the council. And Terry has been, or not on the council, but working for the council. And Terry Carnes, my co-author, has worked for the council for Since 1974. A, a lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we've had the opportunity to both observe and participate in the adoption of of a system that has both remained the same and has been uh, developed and uh, implemented in different ways throughout the years. So, just to so after statehood, after uh, the Constitution was adopted and statehood was uh, implemented in the very first year, in 1960, uh, Governor uh, Governor Egan Egan um, called for the first. Um, meeting of the Judicial Council, and uh, he appointed the three uh, the three lay members, the three public members, and the Bar Association um, appointed the attorney members. They interestingly they did not yet have a chief justice, so one of the lay members acted as chair. And at their very first meeting in 1960 they discussed how the system would be put into place. And they said, well, we'll have to have an application or nominations for people who want to be judges. And then um, we'll have to get some information about them. And the, the people that they turned to, of course, for information about the applicants, um, the thought was to uh, involve their peers. And this was a discussion that they'd had at the Constitutional Convention um, when they were talking about how, what, uh, what the composition of the council would be. They said, well, we have to have lawyers on the council because they know their peers the best and they can be the best judge of who would be good judges. So the, the, the first council said, okay, so we're going to have the people uh, nominated to the council um, Judicial applicants. Uh, they were the, the initial pr mechanism was that that uh, people would use a nominating petition instead of an application, um, and so their peers would nominate them, or they could self-nominate themselves to for consideration uh, by the council. And then um, we'll ask their peers. So they in implemented this survey of or this system of asking the bar for their opinions about how good the, their, uh, these applicants who wanted to be judges were, so that the bar could reflect on that and give commentary. And so from the very first uh, meeting, laid down the foundation and the construct of how these people would be judged and how they would proceed through the process. The, the uh, council received the applications, they conducted the bar poll and received information about the, the applicants. They met, they talked, and they voted. And uh, that's basically the system we have today. It's been refined, but it, it, um, it's a stable system and um, it's been uh, a very useful tool for the council. I'm just going to go through um, some of the uh, processes that the council um, has used and is currently using, and um, we'll go from there. So 
From the very beginning, they noticed up the vacancy. They sent out notice to the bar. They received applications. Um, and the application uh, is very different now than it used to be. They used to just uh, have a name. And of course, the bar was like 50 people then. So uh, everybody knew everybody. And, but now, there's a 40-page application. It asks all manner of questions about um, a person's background, legal history, uh, um, their experience. It asks for a writing sample. Um, and uh, uh, asks for any, any um, additional information about community activities, especially. And then, um, and then our work starts. We review the applications. and. Uh, we look for any, you know, concerns that might arise. We do reference checks. We do background investigations. Uh, we look at the bar surveys and see if any concerns crop up there. Um, and then the bar survey has changed quite a bit over the years. They used to just send out a poll. Well, do you think this person's good? Do you think this person's <coughs> not good? Um, and it's gone back and forth in the, in the qualities and characteristics that they have looked at. But, but they ask, uh, currently, we ask about five things. Professional competence, integrity, judicial temper temperament, fairness, and suitable, suitability of experience. And then there's kind of this overall, um, do you say, overall uh, professional qualifications. And that's, that turns into you know, all things totaled up. What do, you, what do people think about their peers? And um, it, it gives a, a good. Uh, quantifiable, um, somewhat subjective, because you're asking people what they think, but quantifiable method for, for the council members to look at to determine uh, how, how good, in a relative sense, the applicants are. Um, and we've, you know, there's, there's different ways that the uh, information has been analyzed over the years, but it, it basically comes <coughs> down to one <coughs> tool, and I want to emphasize this a lot, because sometimes it's, it, there's a perception that the bar survey drives the decision making of the council, and it really doesn't. The council considers all of the materials in front of it, gathered from um, both the application, the bar survey, all the public information, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but, but the bar survey is one tool among many that the council members utilize to make their decisions. It's an important tool. It's one that was, um, information from the bar was deemed critical by the constitutional delegates for, uh, for the development of a merit-based system because you have to know how good the lawyers are to know who the good judges will be. But, but it's not the end all. And we recognize that the bar survey can be manipulated and, um, and skewed in some respects by who's, who's responding to the bar survey and what their interests are. So we do break down and look, and, and the staff breaks it down and looks at the response rate. It looks at who's responding and what, um, what concerns are reflected in, in the responses to the bar survey and also what, um, underlying agenda might be there. So it's important, but not an end-all tool. Um, and then uh, we, an important process uh, is of the council is not only soliciting information but from the bar as a whole, but also from um, people who have worked directly with the, the applicants. So we solicit, we send out council questionnaires, which um, are directed to people who have very recent experience with the applicants and, um, and have worked on cases with those applicants in the last, we try to get people you know, from about the last five years. That's not always possible if the people haven't been in litigation, if the applicants haven't been in litigation. But we try to capture as much information as we can because more information is better, and the more sources of information is better. 
And so we, we talked to the bars, we, we solicited information from the bar as a whole, we solicited information particularly from people who have worked with the applicant, and then um, we, we go back and we hold public hearings at every place where there's an open vacancy, the council travels to that place, interviews the, um, the applicants, and we, we solicit information from the community because their uh, experience about their community, about what their community needs, about what, uh, what kind of person would be a good reflection of that community is critically important to the council members. The, um, it's interesting listening to the sort of philosophical and, and principles of this, you know, the constitutional underpinnings, but it's also important, and that's kind of sort of a top-down approach, but it's, it's very critical to the council members that their decision-making is a ground-up approach. They look at who, who these judges matter to, and the, the, the judges matter to this community. So the community concerns are, are vital. So hopefully um, it's our goal that we get uh, community participation at, at these uh, public hearings that we hold. And also we solicit information from the public as a whole through our website, through letters. We receive, I receive phone calls. I love receiving phone calls from people who are interested in the judicial selection system in Alaska so that um, I can talk about the process and also receive their people's concerns about the process and, and bring those to the council members um, so that can be a part of their decision making process. Now I mentioned, I've mentioned the interview a couple times. Council members, as I, as I said, they go out and they interview. They interview every single person who's applied, um, which is somewhat unique in our, uh, in our system. You know, you, I, I've never applied for a job that every single person gets an interview, but in our process we want to hear from everybody. And in fact, it, it's, a, it's a good way to receive commentary from the bar. Even the people who aren't selected, who aren't nominated, bring so much information and experience to our table that it becomes part of, um, of the, the council member's uh, entire body of knowledge about who would be a good judge and who wouldn't be a good judge. <laughs> Am I, am I uh, running over time? Okay, so we, we've talked about the interview. Uh, everyone gets interviewed. And um, we'll talk about a little bit about the criteria. As Brett mentioned, the, and the, the bar survey reflects, we've got professional competence, integrity, fairness, temperament, judgment, legal life experience. And these, by the way, these uh, selection procedures are no mystery. They're on our website. They've been published in every council report since statehood, the development of them. And then uh, I just want to say one thing about the most qualified standard. Uh, it's a super important standard. Uh, if we want to take more questions about it, I'd be happy to talk about it. But it's a relative determination. Who is most qualified, who is the best available timber, is a relative standard based on all the candidates who, or all the applicants who have applied, the position that's applied for, and that goes back to that community standard, and um, the community in which the position is located. So all of that goes into the mix, into who, into deciding who is the best and most uh, qualified and able to serve uh, the judiciary for Alaska. And I don't have time to talk about everything I want to talk about, uh, but I'm happy to field any questions or talk um, at the break. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.